Unit four, lesson seven, the aftermath of World War One. Unit four, lesson seven, vocabulary. The tide turns when American troops were entered into the actual combat. See, American troops were not as exhausted as other European soldiers. They hadn't been fighting for three years. The German military had weakened over time, especially with the great influenza pandemic, where half a million German soldiers in June of 1918 were incapacitated. They were so sick they couldn't continue fighting. Half a million troops. So the central powers started to fall apart. The Bulgarians and the Ottoman Turks surrender. They want no more of the war. German soldiers turned against their government, with many soldiers refusing to continue fighting for Germany. Even Kaiser Wilhelm was forced to step down. Germany was declared a republic, not a dictatorship any longer. This led to the armistice, an agreement to stop fighting, which was signed between Germany and France. It was signed November 11th, 1918 on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, peace would come to the area. This map shows you just how little the front lines changed throughout the entire conflict. The blue line is the Western Front as it was December of 1914. The red line is the Western Front as it was November 11th, 1918. Nearly four years later for the line to have moved only a couple miles in some areas. 20 million people died over such little areas of land. After the armistice of November 11th, the Allies meet at Versailles. It was the Palace of Versailles in France. It became as known as the Paris Peace Conference, and the big four who attended were the President Woodrow Wilson from the United States, President Georges Clemenceau from France, the Prime Minister David Lloyd George of Great Britain, and the Prime Minister Vittorio Orlando from Italy. Here are the four heads of state from Italy, Great Britain, France, and the United States. United States President Woodrow Wilson had a plan for peace, called it his 14-point plan. Among those points were to end the secret treaties between countries, to allocate for freedom of the seas, so no more unfettered submarine attacks from German U-boats, free trade amongst all nations, reduced military by all nations, and the adjustment of colonial claims to allow more people um, to believe in self-determination. President Wilson believed that allowing people to decide for themselves under what government they wish to live. This would mainly take effect in Africa and Southeast Asia for all the European colonies. With respect to Europe, the Allies would dictate an incredibly harsh peace. Britain and France are more concerned about national security than was the United States. Britain and France, they want to destroy Germany's war-making power. President Clemenceau of France, he wants Germany to pay war reparations to help France rebuild its country. So the Treaty of Versailles is signed in 1919. With it, they, these nations created a League of Nations an international association aimed at keeping the peace among nations. Its permanent members would be Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. The General Assembly members were representatives from 32 allied and neutral nations, including many European nations, but excluding Germany and Russia. The United States would not ratify the Treaty of Versailles. The U.S. actually went back to isolationism, trying to stay out of everyone's business, except financially, where we were helping finance the recovery throughout Europe. 
German, the, the German people were angry at the reparations. Germany itself was angry. And Wilson's plan to allow each country its own fate to be had, the theory of self-determination. Well, African and Asian countries are upset that self-determination does not apply to them. Colonialism still exists. France, Great Britain, and other European nations, including the United States, but hold on to their colonial countries. Japan and Italy are also upset because they did not gain as much land as they had hoped in the aftermath. Some of the problems that Germany faced after its defeat in World War I were an extreme loss of territory. Germany loses much of its land and all of its land that it was trying to reclaim in the North East and Western European area. Germany was forced to limit the size and scope of its military, and they were solely responsible for the war. This was the German war guilt clause. Germany was made to feel as if it was the only reason that the world was engaged in the conflict. As such, Germany had to pay back $33 billion to the Allies in war reparations. Germany was broke. So they were forced to borrow the money from the United States to pay France and Great Britain. The money that France and Great Britain received from Germany was used to pay back the money and loans that they had taken out from the United States. Some of the aftermath led to the creation of new nations after World War I. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was broken up. Austria and Hungary became independent sovereign nations. Same for Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. The Ottoman Empire itself was broken up. Turkey being the last sort of vestige of that empire. But new nations formed in the Middle East. Palestine, Iraq, and Transjordan. They were under British rule. And Syria and Lebanon came under French rule. Russia also lost land. Russia lost the area which became the sovereign states of Romania and Poland. Um, they gained some Russian territory. Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania became independent sovereign nations as a result of World War I. These maps show the difference between Europe at the start of World War I and Europe at the end of World War I. The total costs of World War I. The war's extreme costs took a heavy toll on human life. Over 8.5 million soldiers died in World War I. 21 million people were wounded. And over 13 million civilians died during the conflict. Economically, the war cost about 186 billion dollars. Europe's treasuries are drained. Farmlands were destroyed, homes were destroyed, villages, entire towns were destroyed. This creates a lost generation where civilians who were able to make it out of the conflict were under a sense of disillusionment with insecurity and despair running rampant throughout the nation. At one point, the war was costing $10 million an hour. More than the financial side, it was the human costs of the war, with casualties, wounded soldiers, and those who went missing, totaling in the millions for the major ally and central power countries like Austria-Hungary, Britain, France, and Germany. Italy and Russia. The human cost of the war for the Central Powers totaled almost 5 million dead civilians, wounded or missing. And for the Allies, mostly French and Russian citizens, 14 million civilians dead, wounded or missing. Even the colonies contributed into the battle scene in World War I. 
There was fighting in the colonies themselves, and colonial subjects came to Europe to fight with the ruling nation. Throughout the war, over 10 million colonial soldiers were mobilized, and 1.6 million colonial soldiers were killed in battle, with another near 500,000, near half a million colonial soldiers that were wounded in battle and lived to tell the tale. There was another cost to the war, another cost to this type of battle, this type of conflict, and it's trauma. The psychological disturbance caused by prolonged exposure to active warfare, especially when you're under bombardment, when you're under attack. The symptoms of this kind of trauma include fatigue, tremors, confusion, nightmares, and impaired sight and hearing. Such trauma was known as shell shock. Shell shock was generally seen as a sign of emotional weakness or cowardice. Many soldiers suffering from the condition were charged with desertion, cowardice, or insubordination and sent to jail. 